Hey everybody, today I'd like to give an introduction to the first isomorphism theorem. Um, this is credited to Jordan in 1870, so a pretty long time ago now. So what does the theorem say? It says let phi be an, a homomorphism from a group G to a group G bar. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to um, consider the, the kernel of this homomorphism. So the kernel of this homomorphism is all of the things in G that get sent to the identity of G bar under phi. Okay? We saw in the last video that the kernel is always a normal subgroup. All right, so this kernel here is always a normal subgroup of G. And therefore, since it's a normal subgroup, we can quotient out by it, okay? So we can form this quotient group, G modulo its kernel. All right, we also learned in the last lecture or two that the image of phi, phi of G, is a subgroup of G bar. In particular, it's a group in its own right. So phi of G is a group. It's inherited with the uh, group operation of G bar. All right, so once again, the kernel is all things in G that phi maps to zero. Okay, that's what we're gonna quotient out by on the left. And then phi of G, the image of phi, is all things that are hit when you apply phi to them. All things in G bar that are hit when you apply phi to them. Okay, so the first isomorphism says that um, when you have any homomorphism, if you mod out the left side by the kernel, then the resulting quotient group highlighted here, um, highlighted here on the left is isomorphic to the image group. All right, so we have an isomorphism. How do we map from the left-hand side, this G mod the kernel, to the right-hand side, the image of phi? Well, you take an element of the quotient group, i.e. a coset of the normal subgroup, a coset of the kernel, that's what I have here, it's a coset of a kernel, and you just map it to its the image of the coset representative G under phi. Okay, so um, in class we'll check that this map is well defined and things like that, but for this introductory video we'll omit some of those details. In summary, given any homomorphism phi, we get an isomorphism. G mod its, its kernel, G mod the kernel of phi, is isomorphic to phi of G, the image of phi which is a group in its own right as a subgroup of, of G bar. Okay, let's, uh, there's a lot of notation going on there. So let's see some examples. Um, let's see how, how, this says, how this is applied. The first example is going to be a little bit uh, uh, roundabout, um, a little bit of circular logic, um, <clears throat> but that's okay. The reason why it's a little bit roundabout is because we've been working with this group z mod nz, you know, the integer 0 up to n minus 1 with addition mod n. We've been working with this for a long time, even before we uh, defined quotient groups. But it turns out this is a quotient group. You can sort of see from the name. This is z mod nz. Okay, so let's consider this homomorphism phi from the group of integers to the group of integers mod n, and phi is just defined by taking any inter, integer j and mapping it to j mod n. Okay, so if, if n here is 10, then 0 up through 9 all map to themselves, 10 maps to 0, 11 maps to 1, 12 maps to 2, etc. Negative 1 maps to 9, negative 2 maps to 8, etc. What's the kernel of phi? What are the things that get mapped to zero? Well, the kernel of phi, the things that get mapped to zero, are just all things divisible by n. Zero, n, two, n, three, n, 
negative n, negative 2n, etc. Another name for that is the subgroup of z generated by n. And another name for that is nz. You know, you take every integer, you multiply it by n, and you get all the integers divisible by n. Okay. So if I look at this first isomorphism theorem, I've identified the kernel of phi. The kernel of phi I've identified, you know, this kernel of phi I've identified as nz. All right. What is, what is this right-hand side in the first isomorphism theorem? What is phi of g? What's the image of phi? Okay. It turns out that phi of z is as large as it could be. The image of phi is as large as it could be. It's this entire group, g bar on the right-hand side. Why is that? That's just because phi is surjective. So when I take the numbers from negative infinity to t to infinity, and I take the mod n, I hit all the numbers from 0 to 9. Okay? So this first isomorphism theorem says that, says the following. Oops, sorry. This first isomorphism theorem says, I hope the suspense is killing you. All right, you take g, g in this case is, is just the integers. You take g and you mod it out by its kernel. Okay, we mod out by the kernel of phi. That's supposed to be isomorphic to the image of phi. Okay, that's our first isomorphism theorem 10.3. That's the main point of class today. Up above, we identified what the kernel of phi was. The kernel of phi is nz. So I can replace this kernel of phi with nz, okay? And then also, I know what the image of phi is. The image of phi is as large as it could be. The image of phi is z mod nz. All right, so I get the uh, maybe uh, uh, not too surprising isomorphism that z mod nz is isomorphic to z mod nz. So it, it feels a little bit roundabout. But in, again, that's in part because um, we didn't define z mod nz at first using quotient groups, even though that's sort of the more mature way to define them. And at least we see that the first isomorphism checks out. It's not giving us anything crazy or wrong. Alrighty. Let's move to some more interesting examples where we actually prove that quotient groups are, interest, are isomorphic to other interesting groups. Alrighty. Let's consider this homomorphism phi from the symmetric group on n elements to z mod 2z. It's going to be defined as follows. Sigma, a permutation, gets mapped to zero if sigma is an even permutation, if sigma is in the alternating group, an. And sigma gets mapped to one if sigma is an odd permutation, if it's not in the alternating group. So we've discussed before why this is a homomorphism. Two even permutations combined give you an even. An even permutation combined with an odd gives you an odd permutation and two odd permutations combined to give you an even permutation. Just like in Z mod 2Z, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 0. So that's, that's why phi is a homomorphism. OK, so our main theorem of class today says that G, or this group Sn, mod its kernel under phi is isomorphic to the image of phi. Okay, that's just that's just just this, except I'm replacing g with S n. S n is my um, my uh, group that the homomorphism is mapping out of. So I get um, oh great, you can see both at once. I get um, S n mod its kernel 
is isomorphic to the, uh, the image of phi when I have this map phi from Sn into some other group. Okay, now we know what the kernel of phi is. So the identity in Z mod 2Z is zero. So what maps to the identity in Z mod 2Z? It's the alternating group. All elements in the alternating group get mapped to the identity in Z mod 2Z and nobody else does. So that's why this kernel here is just the alternating group, AN. What is the image of phi? Well, the image of phi is all things in Z mod 2Z, they get hit after I apply phi. And everything gets hit, it's both zero and one gets hit. So I get all of Z mod 2Z. All right. So now we have a proof, not just a claim, now we have a proof that the symmetric group mod its alternating group is isomorphic to Z mod 2Z, the integer is mod 2. Okay. The isomorphism theorem is one of the best ways to understand um, the structure of a quotient group. So here's some quotient group that might scare you. It's a little hard to get your head around what's going on with this group. Uh, what does its group structure look like? Well, you want to find, to understand this quotient group, you want to find a map phi that has the, um, the normal subgroup as the kernel. And then you can use this first isomorphism theorem to understand this quotient group. As we've done here, we've understood this quotient group as a much simpler group, Z mod 2Z. Okay, let's do a more complicated example. Z is going to map from GL to R, the invertible 2i2 matrices with coefficients in the reals. Remember, invertible just means determinant non-zero. It's going to map out of that group, GL2R, into the non-zero reals equipped with multiplication. That star, that superscript, superscript star, means the non-zero reals. How is this homomorphism defined? Well, phi of a matrix A is just going to be the de determinant of A. The determinant is a real number, and it's non-zero when you restrict attention to invertible matrices. Why is phi a homomorphism? Let me just write this here. Why is phi a homomorphism? So the answer, if you remember linear algebra, it happens to be true that the determinant of the product of two matrices is equal to the product of the two determinants. Okay, and this on the left-hand side is phi of AB, and this on the right-hand side is just phi of A times phi of B. And this is true for all matrices A and B. Okay, so, so that's why phi is a homomorphism on this example. All right, let's apply the first isomorphism theorem to this homomorphism. You can apply the, the first isomorphism theorem to any homomorphism. And it says that if you take your original group that the homomorphism is mapping out of, mod out by the kernel, then that group is isomorphic to the image of your homomorphism phi. Okay, so all this is our new theorem, theorem 10.3, the first isomorphism theorem. What is the kernel? So the kernel is, well, to answer that, first you need to know the identity in, in the group on the right-hand side. The identity in the non-zero reals under multiplication is one. One is the multiplicative identity, okay? So the kernel is all matrices whose determinant is one. And that has a name in mathematics that's called the special linear group. 
So that's what the SL stands for. SL2R is the special linear group for two by two matrices with coefficients in the reals. It's all matrices whose determinant is one. All right, so that's the kernel, the special linear group. So that's where this equality is coming from. I've replaced kernel phi with the name for that kernel. Excuse me, what's the image of phi? Well, I can find a, mate, a two by two matrix with whatever determinant I want. Okay, it turns out for any real number, um, there exists a two by two matrix that has that real number as its determinant. And if I want all non-zero real numbers, there exists a, an invertible two by two matrix that has that real number as its determinant. So since phi is surjective, that's where I'm getting this last equality currently highlighted in blue. Okay, so this is an apparently complicated quotient group. A general linear group of all two by two matrices that are invertible, quotiented out by the a special linear group, the matrices whose determinant is one. But the structure of this quotient group is actually quite simple. It's this recognizable group of the non-zero real numbers under multiplication. So again, when you're given a quotient group that, uh, that, that's hard to understand, like this quotient group here, a good way to understand its structure is to find a homomorphism, phi, that has the desired normal subgroup that you're quotienting out by as the kernel. And then you can apply the first uh, isomorphism theorem to that homomorphism to understand the structure of, of your quotient group. All right. So let's end with the following theorem. The following theorem really tells you that kernels of homomorphisms and normal subgroups should be thought of as really one and the same. We've already seen how kernels are normal. So kernels of homomorphisms always are normal subgroups. This next theorem says that furthermore, any normal subgroup can be realized as the kernel of some map, some homomorphism. Okay, so the theorem 10.4 says, every normal subgroup of a group G is a kernel of some homomorphism out of G. In particular, let's, let's give one such homomorphism. A normal subgroup N, I wanna find this normal subgroup N as a kernel. It's the kernel of the following homomorphism from phi maps from G to G mod N. How do I define that? Well, I take an arbitrary element of G, little g, and I map it to the coset of N, which is just G N, okay? Um, so what I'm doing here is I have a normal subgroup of G since I have a normal subgroup of G, N, that's why I can take this quotient, right? N is a normal subgroup. That's why I'm allowed to take this quotient. And then I, I build this map in sort of the uh, way you might expect. An element of G needs to map into the quotient group into a coset. Oh, my video's paused. Let's wait a second. Okay, we're back. An element little g in my group G needs to map to an element in G mod N, the quotient group. Those elements are all cosets of N. So I'm gonna map little g to the coset G N. Okay, so once again, any normal subgroup N of a group G can be seen as the kernel of a homomorphism. And it's the kernel of this homomorphism. You map from the group to the quotient group G mod N by taking any element little g to the left coset of N by little g.
Okay, let's do two examples. The integers that are divisible by 5, so 0, 5, 10, 15, negative 5, negative 10, negative 15, this is a normal subgroup of Z, right? Z is abelian, so every subgroup is normal, okay? So let's go from Z to Z mod 5Z, as described here. Let's consider this homomorphism Z from Z mod 5Z obtained by mapping any element G J to its left coset by 5z. Okay, so that right there is this equation. Alright, that's just this equation. Alright, so <clears throat> what I'm doing is I'm taking any integer, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, etc. And I just map it to its coset by 5z. So 11, for example, maps to the coset 11 plus 5z, which is the same as the coset 1 plus 5z. So you can think of 11 as mapping to 1. Okay, uh, 13 maps to the coset 13 plus 5z, which is the same as the coset 3 plus 5z. So you can think of 13 as mapping to 3. 15 maps to the coset 15 plus 5z, which is the same as the coset 0 plus 5z. So 15 maps to 0. 15's in the kernel. Anything divisible by um, 5 is in this kernel. So what is the kernel of phi? Unsurprisingly, it's 5z. Okay, all things divisible by 5. And that was our goal, right? Our goal here was to take any normal subgroup and realize it as a kernel of some homomorphism. Here our normal subgroup was 5z and we've realized it as the kernel of this homomorphism. Last example for the day. Um, the alternating group turns out is a normal subgroup of the symmetric group, and it's the kernel of this map that we've already seen. Oh, different map. Okay. Um, the alternating group is the kernel of the homomorphism phi from the symmetric group to the symmetric group mod the alternating group, defined by sending uh, permutation sigma to the coset of the alternating group sigma times the alternating group. So what I have here is just um, exactly this. So AN is my N, it's my normal subgroup. SN is my G, it's my group. I want to realize the alternating group as a kernel. So I build this homomorphism phi from my group G to G mod N. I build this homomorphism phi from the symmetric group to the symmetric group mod the alternating group. How do I define it? Well, an element sigma, a permutation, just maps to the coset of An by sigma. And it turns out that the kernel of this map is phi as desired. So it turns out that the kernel of phi is exactly the alternating group as desired. We wanted to take this normal subgroup, the alternating group, and realize it as a kernel. All right. Thanks for your attention, and uh, until next time.